Hello everyone. My name is Amar Jot Singh and I'm the founder and CEO of Skylark Labs. And today I'll be speaking about a project which focuses on the utilization of artificial intelligence for uh, the benefit of society as a whole. Hence it is under the AI for good category. And the project focuses on utilizing AI to recover children who have been abducted and pushed into brothels in India. And we have been undertaking this project over the past um, one year. And we have been working with several nonprofits in India who have been using this, this system uh, to save these girls. So I'll be walking you through that project and how they have utilized the system and the progress they have made and how it has been beneficial to them in retrieving these girls. So, as I mentioned in the talk, I'll go through the problem of human trafficking in India. Then I'll go through child trafficking in the place where we ran these pilots, which is a place called Varanasi. Then I'll speak a bit about the nonprofit which is using our system. Then I'll go into the system itself, which is the sensor system. And finally, I'll go to the conclusion. And the picture which you see on the right is uh, of this lady who is one of the founders of this nonprofit called Guria, with whom we work. And these children are some of the children they have retrieved from the brothels. So human trafficking in India is a pandemic. It's a major problem all over the world, but especially in India, just in 2016, over 60,000 children were abducted and only 220 of them were ever reported. And the major reasons, reasons why these kids are abducted is they're pushed into forced labor, uh, they're sexually exploited for prostitution, they're forced into early marriage, and a lot of them are used for domestic help. And the major um, hotspot, if you will, which, which, is in, which is Varanasi, the place marked with a star, is where kids are kidnapped from all over the India and pushed into the brothels over there. And that was the reason we chose uh, this particular place to run our pilot so that we could save as many kids as possible because it's uh, there are a lot of the children who are uh, missing are in this in the brothels over here. So child trafficking in, in Varanasi. Uh, so, the, so the kids which are which are being prostituted over here, or the girls which are being prostituted over here, they are primarily kids who are kidnapped from weaker sections of society. Uh, they're girls who are lured from uh, smaller cities to this place uh, on the promise of a job. And a lot of the time, these girls are actually sold by their families because these families are in financial destitute and they get a small sum from this brothel owners and they just sell their girl. And that's the reason a lot of these girls are never found because no one is really looking for these girls. Um, and when I came across like these brothels and I visited them, a lot of, a lot of them myself, this was like one of the reasons for us to, to take up this project. And this was like one of the motivations because like the girls were legally suffering over here, but there's no one who cares for them. Um, and like I can try to motivate this problem as much as I can, but I can never do a good enough job um, myself. So I picked up some statements from the police reports which were filed by the victims who were recovered from these brothels. So if you see on the top right, there is a statement from this girl called Priya. She's 11 years old and she speaks of um, the brothel owners uh, telling her to comply to do prostitution and she refused and they burnt her legs with uh, a hot iron rod. And there's another similar statement where the girl refused to comply with the brothel owners and they attacked her, they busted her head, which eventually um, developed uh, worms. Um, and I always wonder that like, this, this prostitution is happening right in the center of the city and how is it possible? Aren't the law enforcement doing anything? And and when I and, and we came across the fact that the the police is actually involved with the brothel owners because they get uh, a commission from the brothel owners or like a monthly stipend kind of a thing, if you will. Um, uh, and that's the reason why they don't take any actions. So 
there's another statement at the bottom where there's there's this girl who um ran away from the brothel approached a police officer and said well i've been being kept in a brothel forcefully can you please help me and the police officer took her back to the brothel uh and said if she runs away uh i'm not sure i'll be able to do anything and you keep and since i brought her back i need a commission from you so this is the state over there and this is where this nonprofit, this amazing nonprofit, comes into picture called Korea, and they have been working uh, in this problem for the past 25 years. Over the past 25 years, uh, they have saved 800 girls. They have filed criminal cases against 400 criminals. Unfortunately, only 28 of them were ever convicted. But their policy is to uh, go to these brothels, do surveillance operations collect evidence against these brothel owners they are illegal that they're illegally keeping these children and then finally save these children with the help of the police by forcing them to rage or go through that process so as, as i mentioned that they have been like working for the past 25 years and their strategy is twofold they try to create awareness among the locals so that they don't participate in this trade and they also um uh, educate other people so that they also don't participate in this in this sex trade which you see is an image on the right that one of the volunteers is giving a lecture on this on the left you see that some of the children who are retrieved or some of the kids who are of the prostitutes they give them free education so that they are not lured back into the same trade so that's a picture of a school which is right in the center of the of the red light district so Goriash uh, is prevention strategy, uh, is education. So how they go about saving the kids is that let's say there is a kid uh, who is missing uh, or is found somewhere. Oh, so sorry, who's who's missing? So the so the the uh, parents of the child they take this picture, they go to the police, which you see an arrow down, and the police doesn't do anything because, as I mentioned, they're getting commission from the brothel owners. And then the police takes this, and the, then the parents take this picture to the nonprofit who goes to the brothel, collect evidence that the brothel has the child in question, goes to the police, takes a lot of volunteers with them, and eventually it results into a raid and a recovery, which you can see at the bottom. Now, the major challenge is that you have to visit the brothels multiple times to collect facial images, which is usually done by a hidden camera. And since you have to do this multiple times, it's, it's quite dangerous. Uh, once you are lucky enough to come back and collect, once you're lucky enough to collect the image of the child in question, you come back and they used to manually match this image of a child with 1500 hard copy records they had. So they had to do this manually, which was time consuming. And also the children who were kidnapped early on, once they have been in the brothel for a few years, their facial features change a lot. So looking at these images manually was even very hard to match because the children have aged a lot. A lot of the time, the kids who they found in these brothels, the image was not in the database. As I mentioned, some of the families just sold them. So no one is looking for them. And that further was very difficult. So this is where our children's safety and recovery systems comes in. So the first thing we did in the system was that it took all the pictures which they had um, as hard copies and we digitalized them so we made a uh, digital data set and the second job was that we had to develop a face recognition system which could uh, perform face recognition invariant of the age of the child and in some cases the image of the child was not in the database so in that case uh, we took pictures of the parents and we put their pictures in the database and we also told them to make sketches of the child and the reason that image is not in the database is because some of the families never ever took a picture in their whole life because they didn't have the resources to do so and so this is where our system uh if it made a right match which was like very quickly as compared to the manual matching which they were doing before uh they would take this information to the police and convince them to raid. so so our system was primarily helpful in collecting this evidence uh, that a certain child is being held uh, in the brothel. So as I said, 
uh, the first step was uh, digitalization of the hard copy images which they had. You can see on the right side that these are the examples of some of the kind of images they have had. And you can see that the, uh, the images are there, they're in very bad shape. Some of the images are uh, have like these writings on it. Uh, they have like this um, grainy stuff in it. They're noisy. Some of them are blurry. Some of them have been smoothened out by the photographers. So um, the facial features are more or less destroyed. So it was a very hard problem to solve. Um, so once these data sets have been um, uh, digitalized, uh, the objective was that we want to build an age invariant system. And you can build the age invariant system by collecting images of people at different ages and then pushing them through a model which learns to uh, which learns parameters which tells the model that all these images which have aged over time belong to the same person uh, and for some of the images uh, for some of the cases we had multiple images but for most of the other cases we just had a single image per person so we have so we used uh, generative addresses models to generate these age uh, these images which vary with with age so you can see some examples of these cases uh, on the right hand side and once we generated these images of uh, of uh, children at different ages uh, they were pushed into the model and the second so the second uh, case was that for some of the cases there was no image of the child so in that case we would draw a sketch of the we would tell the parents to draw a sketch of the children and this would be later used to uh, learn a age invariant system which could also work with sketches and finally for some of the children there is no picture of them in the database because the parents never took the picture so in that case we take the pictures of the children and uh, this is further used to generate a model which can do kinship analysis so an example of the data set would be that you will have like this image of a child which varies at different ages and then you collect the images of the father the mother the sibling which is further used to generate this kinship analysis system so this is our sensor pipeline so we have first a face detector uh, which uh, extracts the face from an image frame and after that we push it through our hybrid network and you can read more about it in our research paper which once trained with this data set learns to recognize raw faces at different ages learns to recognize sketches at different ages and also learns to recognize um, uh, an image at a later age by matching it to to the image of the parent and the and the uh, image of the parents so the benefits of this scatternet ai pipeline which we have made is that it's a hybrid network so normally in a deep network you have multiple layers an example of that is a1 and you have you train this network end to end and you learn hierarchy of features which eventually classifies uh, uh, the image as uh, a certain child <clears throat> but like our architecture has this fixed front end which extracts edge edge type features from the raw images in a totally handcrafted way so these are battery of wavelets and once these low level edge features are extracted we put another convolutional layer on top, which is able to connect these edges together to learn more complex features, which are eventually used to classify uh, a certain image as a certain child. Now, the benefit of using this kind of pipeline is that since you are learning only one layer of features now instead of two, the number of labeled examples which you need are less. And since you already have edge based features built in, and you're just building high level features on top of it your network will train quickly as well and here's an example of that that if you try to train a network with um, four different experiments which we did over here the network with a scatternet in front would converge much quickly 
than the normal network. So that's the AI pipeline. Now let's go into how the nonprofit is using our uh, AI pipeline. So the volunteers have an app, which you can see in the middle. So if they find a child at a railway station, they can click the picture of the child, push it through our app, and it will tell whether that picture is in our database or not. And the second case is that when they go to the brothels, they use a live spy, they use a, a spy camera, which throws the video back to our servers, which is processed in real time. And it can tell that in a crowd, there, there, is a, there is a person or a child who is in the database and then they can take appropriate action as necessary. So this is an example <clears throat> of one of our field tests where we are trying to look for a specific person in the crowd. And on the top right, you can see the picture of that specific person when uh, that person was young and we are matching it to the person at a much later age and you can see that still it is able to find that person in a huge crowd uh, and you can see that the this is another example where we are trying to find the person at the top in the crowd and if you can see that the person we are trying to look is over here at the bottom. So from this crowd of almost 200, 300 people, we are still able to find the person of interest, which I believe is, uh, in my opinion, pretty impressive. So overall, the system has been used in 13 operations so far, and we have found one child. And the reason we have found just one child is because uh, the data set which we have is relatively is relatively small as compared to children which are in in the in the brothel. So a lot of the time the system doesn't have a match. And also we have done only a handful of operations. So the future work involves scaling up this data set and using it in more operations so that we can find more children. And if you want to know more about us, you can email me. We have two offices in India and one in San Francisco, and our company. Skylark Labs primarily specializes in different kind of threat detection systems, which we which we develop for different type of defense organizations. But at this one, we specifically wanted to use AI to uh, to aid the nonprofit so that they could retrieve the code. Thank you very much.